I came to the harpsichord uh, because of a demo, kind of similar to what I'm going to show you today by a wonderful harpsichordist in town, Trevor Stevenson, uh, who really opened my ears to the sounds of early music, to this idea of, well, what did music sound like in box day? Uh, while I would never propose that I know the answer to that question, I would say that an instrument like the harpsichord can help fine-tune our ears to perhaps start to ask these questions. What did music sound like in box day? So uh, this instrument, the harpsichord, was really at its heyday for a long, long time. I think the first harpsichords were built in the early 1300s. And this really remained the king of the keyboard instruments uh, for about 500 years until about 1806, when a great revolution happened in Europe where the, uh, the, the harpsichord kind of overnight became obsolete because the technology of the piano that was developed in Italy about 100 years earlier made its way to Western Europe. And the early pianos that Bach would have been familiar with, because he did know about the piano and he had played on pianos, we know that at a certain point instrument builders came through his jobs with pianos to show Bach. Um, those instruments didn't sound very good. And the primary, the primary reason that those early pianos didn't sound very good is because they didn't have the luxury of the great German engineering. Um, what we're going to talk about in the harpsichord is this beauty of sound of the plucked string. And anybody that plays any plucked string instruments, like the harp or the guitar, knows that a low tension string sounds very beautiful when it's plucked. Low tension, not a lot of tension on the string. But a hammered string that's needed on a piano requires an immense amount of tension. Um, and so it was the reinforcement of the body of the instrument that made the piano really sing the way that we hear it today. But those early pianos were rather dull, that piano, that, that Bach heard. And he kind of said, well, what's the big deal? I can play dynamics anyway on the harpsichord. He's like, I don't understand why I would want this thing. Um, so what I want to do today is I want to show you a bit of the inner workings of how the harpsichord works. I know it's a long distance, but I can kind of take out some of the pieces and show you uh, at a distance. Um, and also kind of give you some of the ideas of uh, perhaps aesthetically what the harpsichord could offer to the composers of Bach's day. So I'm going to take out um, a jack from this instrument and show you how it works. You will notice on the harpsichord that everything is not really held in place. The instrument just purely works upon gravity. Even the music desk itself just rests on top of the frame of the instrument. Um, the mechanism compared to pianos is really quite rudimentary. When you push a key down, it's a simple teeter-totter. Inside the instrument, the key lever goes up. You push this side down, the other side goes up, and it pushes up a jack which is just simply resting on top of the key in a slot. And when the jack goes up, it plucks the string on the way up. And just like that, that's the entire mechanism. This little piece of wood here is called a jack, and it has a tiny plectra sticking out of it. In the time of uh, the Baroque period, uh, they used bird feather, the same thing they used to write with, bird quill, usually crow, but they also used turkey and other, other birds. Um, but this mechanism is more than meets the eye. It's actually quite ingenious, and they must have really, really cared about how this works, because there's a tiny piece of wood inside of it called a, called a tongue, where the plectra goes through at 90 degrees, and on the way up, the tongue can only flex in one direction, so on the way up it plucks, and on the way down the tongue can flex away from the string, so then it creates a little escapement. So the quill can slide past the string, thereby allowing this little red piece of cloth, or uh, in this case felt, rest on the string, dampening the string. So it goes on, it plucks on the way up, and on the way down it dampens. Beautiful. For the 500 years of the harpsichord's evolution, this never changed. The same mechanism was in play. Although they added more keys and more manuals and different stops and all kinds of little gizmos, this basic mechanism is the same on every harpsichord.
So what is the aesthetic of the harpsichord sound? I often think because Bach's music is so closely related to God, that he must have loved the aesthetic lift of the sound. When you strike a harpsichord key, the sound goes up into the heavens. Kind of feel like it goes up in the air. Whereas the piano has this sort of terrestrial roll of the sound. It kind of, it kind of washes over you in a rolling type motion. Much longer sustain on the piano, and sort of a slower envelope of the sound. Part of the thing that we notice with the nature of the harpsichord is that it speaks very clearly and very, very, very quickly. The loudest moment of the sound of the harpsichord is the immediate pluck of the string. Um, and it is this low tension and the very, very thin wire that enables us to get um, the fastest speaking music we can get. You can't really out trill this thing. You can't out play it. It just, it always repeats. It's wonderful. So, uh, so where did Bach get his ideas? Um, this is always kind of interesting. Um, I think most of us that know, know a lot about Bach know him really not as an innovator. Um, he was really uh, very musically conservative for his time. Um, Bach spent his early years as a composer uh, recopying the works of earlier composers, actually getting their music in trunks full of manuscripts from generations past and rewriting them in his own hand. That's kind of how he learned to compose. And then he used those manuscripts to teach his sons and other people in his church how to play. So um, what we find, I think particularly, I'm going to actually start this festival by playing a piece not by Bach. I'm going to start by playing a, uh, two movements of the dance suite by Froberger, who lived uh, a generation before Bach. And what I, the reason that I want to play this for you today is because I really think that Froberger's music can key our ears into perhaps a world that was more connected to the harp and the guitar. I think oftentimes, because of our modern sensibilities, we compare the harpsichord to the piano, which is understandable. They're both keyed instruments. The performer looks about the same. But the sound world of the harpsichord is actually far more connected to the harp and the guitar. So I'm going to play a little example of some Froberger. It's a few minutes of music. And I want you to sort of imagine the lute player or the harpist sitting underneath the tree, maybe wooing their lover or some other sort of, sort of thing. Uh, it's a lovely suite in A minor. So I'm going to give you this, in key of this idea, maybe a quieter world, a simpler world where they used to live. One other important piece of information, I'm going to play an alamond followed by a sarabond. And the sarabond is particularly important, so pay attention, because I'm going to play a box sarabond later.
His music is undeniably different from J.S. Bach's. It's much simpler, but Froberger's music cannot be dismissed out of hand as not being related to Bach. Uh, Froberger is often credited for having invented the keyboard suite itself, these uh, collections of dance movements. Uh, before Froberger's time, this was not a popular thing to do, so all of the wonderful French suites and English suites and the cello suites of J.S. Bach probably would not have happened if it wasn't for music like this. And we also know that it had a huge influence on Bach because he's one of the few composers that actually recopied Froberger's works in his time. So, I don't know. Does this sound like piano music to you? Does it sound like modern music? To me, it sounds like Bach is keen into something much, much older. And a lot of his most famous pieces that we know today, including the Chaconne, uh, the wonderful uh, Bach Chaconne for the solo unaccompanied violin, uh, that was a style that was out of fashion for over a hundred years when Bach wrote it. He's really the master historian, kind of distilling ideas from, for a very, very long time. So music like what I just played, this is all fully written out. Every note is written out, although I do add quite a few embellishments and improvisatory elements, as one would have done in the time. I probably do actually far less than a performer in Froberger's time would have done, but really that's up for debate, who knows. But about 98% of the music written for the harpsichord in the Baroque period was not written out at all, including J.S. Bach's music itself. It was written in something called continuo, which is figured bass. So I'm going to show you an example of a figured bass piece that I'm going to play later today um, in our concert at about 4.30 that Kathy was talking about earlier. It's the minuet number two from his flute sonata in C major. Uh, if I play what Bach wrote on the page for the harpsichord, it sounds like this. Perfectly nice tune, I suppose. But it doesn't really tell us much. Could you even tell you were hearing a minuet? All I heard was thump, 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 thump. But there's no way that a keyboardist in Bach's time, including himself, would have played that. In fact, he wrote little clues in the music, these little numbers above the notes, that tell us that there are other notes that are supposed to be there in the chord. These are the chords that the continuo player is supposed to play. It's sort of like guitar tablature. Once again, we come back to this connection of the harp and the lute. The shape of the hand on the fretboard is very similar to the way figure bass works. When I see a six, my hand goes into this shape. When I see a two, four, six, I go into this shape. And I learn these chord positions so that I can play what the right hand is supposed to play over that bass line. And then I think, hmm, it's a minuet. And my job as the harpsichordist is to play with a good beat. And a minuet has a strong beat one and a weak beat three, so I better make beat three short, and I better make beat one long, I better put a big chord on beat one, I better put a short note on beat three, and then the minuet can hopefully come to life. jazz, and it is very much so. The keyboardist of Bach's time was not merely somebody that plays me on the page. They were also improvisers, they were also composers, and they were also performers. The harpsichord was the marriage of those three things together. So, continuo itself is a sort of shorthand method of composition, and there's no reason to think that the solo works of Bach are not the same type of thing. It's really a shorthand that leads Bach to being able to teach. In fact, the wonderful solo works that we play in concert today, like the French suites, English suites, the well-tempered clavier, the two-part inventions, three-part inventions, those pieces were likely never actually performed in Bach's lifetime. They were used as teaching tools to help students learn how to compose and how to improvise. So, <clears throat> Bach's obsession with the past um, comes from a variety of different sources that I find really, really interesting. But 
I want to return to an idea that we talked to earlier about earlier, and the idea of dynamics. Oftentimes, you've probably all heard this in some way, shape, or form, is that this is a dynamicless instrument, right? Is that it doesn't matter how I play, that the the volume of an individual note cannot change based on how hard or soft I hit the key. Whereas the piano does this beautifully. In fact, the piano, the real revolution with the early piano, wasn't the ability to play loud, it was the ability to play soft. Uh, in fact, most of the early pianos were actually quieter than harpsichords at the time. Um, it was this revolution, the ability to pull sound away from the audience, that was so brilliant, because the, the harpsichord is just always on. It's, it's on button is always there, and the sound goes boom, and it's out there. But in the harpsichord, on the piano, you can kind of pull things away. So, um, as a result of this always on feature, the harpsichord needed to not blend in its sound. So if I play, if I play the very opening chord of this box Sarabond, we're going to return to the Sarabond now. Um, if I play this opening chord in the box Sarabond, the hands are very, very close together, kind of almost right on top of each other but the three notes of the chord are absolutely distinct from one another. We don't hear a blending of the sound. Are you able to really track all three notes? I am. I am. On the piano, however, when I play those same three notes, the piano pulls the sound together. I always think that the harpsichord pushes sound apart. It pushes the notes away from each other. They don't want to blend, but on the piano, it pulls it together. It homogenizes the sound. sounding, the E minor chord becomes one homogenous sound, but on the harpsichord they remain different. So small intervallic changes in the harpsichord, like leaping down an octave, becomes like leaping down into a black hole. very simple harmonies, E minor closely voiced, and then we go to C major, or sorry, G major, open voiced, and it sounds like, like a world of difference, the, di the distance. registral differences happened immediately upon the development of the piano. So much of Bach's writing, the hands are very, very close together, using a very small amount of the instrument. In fact, Bach wrote everything for his keyboards in a four octave range. The modern piano is eight octaves. In fact, the early pianos that Beethoven and Mozart wrote for were five octaves in range. I find these differences very interesting. It probably points to that idea of why was Bach not interested in the piano. Now, I want to be some, make something very, very clear. Um, right now, for anybody wondering, boy, this guy really hates the piano. That is not <laughs> the point of this lecture at all. In fact, uh, if you think that I'm some sort of weirdo purist, you're absolutely wrong. I play Bach on the marimba. How weird is that? I hold four mounts and I play violin music on the marimba. This is not at all the point of my lecture is to slam on people playing for non-traditional instruments. What I'm interested in is, is keen into maybe what the language of the time was and having that maybe some, in some way influence the way that we consider the music today. So um, let's put our pitchforks away, uh, us, us, <laughs> uh, us wonderful pianists that are going to play great Bach on the piano today. I absolutely am a supporter of this and in no way uh, uh, combative of this thing. So I think, let's see here, we talked about continuo, yes. I think 
I may make a brief pause now to ask if anybody, there's, so, there's, so, uh, there's such a nice little audience here, I wonder if anybody has a burning question for me before I play the Sarabande in E minor by Bach. That's an excellent question. The, the quickest answer is, I don't know. However, we do know that an instrument like this, this is te technically an Italian harpsichord, and without getting too super nerdy, there were many different types of harpsichords built in different countries. So there were Italians like these, um, there were German harpsichords, French harpsichords, and the, uh, the wonderful Flemish, which is sort of like a hybrid bike. It's not a mountain bike or a, or, or a racing bike, it's sort of in between, you know? It's the, the Flemish is the hybrid instrument. This is sort of like the racing bike. The, uh, the, 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 Italian, the Italian harpsichord speaks super clearly, super fast. These were easy to transport. This instrument only weighs about 60 pounds. Even though it looks big, it's all made of wood. It's basically like a large guitar, really, the way it's built. And these instruments were very popular. Although they were Italian built, Italian harpsichords were found in Germany, they were found in, in, um, in France. Bach himself owned an instrument like this. He owned many instruments, but he did own a harpsichord like this. They were found um, surviving. So um, instruments like these were pretty common. There were also, um, keyboard playing was very, very popular for women, and in particular, uh, young girls in the Baroque period. Um, it was considered to be a great uh, symbol of status if you could play a keyboard instrument and also sing. So virginal instruments, as they were called, were found in many homes. Uh, that my first instrument was a virginal, and it's a rectangular-shaped harpsichord, sort of like an upright piano, you could imagine, except instead of the strings going up, they go perpendicular to the strings, so it takes up much less room in the home, and the lid opens directly into the performer's face. So you get this wonderful sound. I actually kind of miss my virginal harpsichord. I sold it to get this one. Um, but it is a really welcoming, inviting tone quality. And the virginal instruments are really sought after today. But um, they were thought to kind of keep young girls out of trouble. So, so they were very, very me. common. Uh, yes, I, I didn't want to go completely there, but yes, that's, that's, a, that's actually why they were named that. Yeah, is to kind of keep young girls out of trouble. So they were named the virginal instrument and they were incredibly popular at the time. Um, so yes, we do think that harpsichords were popular. However, compared to the piano boom of the 19th century, harpsichords were probably relatively harder to find in the Baroque period. You know, um, it's not just the invention of the piano, but it was also the fact that a lot of monarchies were toppling at the end of the 18th century that made the harpsichord obsolete. You know, this was really a court instrument that made its way into the middle class, but sort of not in the way the piano did. The piano was really took Western Europe by storm. This needs to be tuned far more frequently than a piano would. Um, as the piano developed, it got more and more metal put inside of it. So uh, the modern grand piano has a very thick iron plate in it. Now they went from just adding a few support beams at first to support the extra tension needed to eventually reinforcing the entire case, double thick and all this kind of stuff. Um, this is where, because it's all wood except for the strings and the tuning pins, uh, any change in temperature or humidity, the instrument will go out of tune. So uh, pretty much every time I, you know, I'm gonna, I tuned it this morning, it's probably already moving. Um, uh, and I'm going to tune it again this afternoon before the afternoon performance. So, you know, it needs to be tuned pretty frequently. For my own practice, maybe I should tune it every time, but I don't, you know. So, yes. It's less stable. And, and that's common with all Baroque instruments by comparison. So, uh, with, uh, without further ado, oh, yes. Yeah, go ahead. Thanks. Sorry to interrupt you. But it occurred to me as you were singing that the great thing about the piano when it was invented was that it could play softly. And I'm mindful of the fact that the word piano in Italian means soft, and the word forte in Italian means strong. So you've got the name, oftentimes the piano is called a piano forte. So that name comes from 
those two terms, which I never thought of in all my years. That's absolutely correct. And the earliest pianos were not just called the pianoforte, they were called the harpsichord that can play forte and piano. They didn't even call it a different instrument. They actually called it still a harpsichord, which, is, which will really blow your mind. The cembalo that can play a uh, piano, a forte. So, um, and it was really the piano that was the revolution, the soft end of things. Yeah, be, being able to create that three-dimensionality of sound. So, um, yeah. Which, of course, you know, in this sort of demanding, rigorous, um, you know, that when you think of music in the 19th century, uh, it becomes much more about the personal expression of the performer. The personal expression of the performer. The inner world. You know, we think about uh, Beethoven writing about his own torments and things like that. I mean, you don't have that really in the Baroque era in the same way. It's much more sort of universal truths, you know, uh, uh, sort of a biblical nature to things. We're, we're far less concerned with the individual performer. So the idea that I would want to shade things and pull things into the background, it's, it's sort of aesthetically not appropriate, you know, for, at least for the time it wasn't. Um, it doesn't mean that we can't do those things today. And certainly, this afternoon, when you hear the harpsichord paired with the flute and paired with the viola da gamba and paired with the violin, there's no shortage of, of dynamics in Baroque music at all. But it's just this particular instrument gives us a real interesting viewpoint into the aesthetics of the time. May I play? Yes, please. Do. Great. So now I'm going to finally play some J.S. Bach. Can we get this party started? Yeah. Okay, okay, good. Uh, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna play. I'm gonna. I'm gonna start the party by playing a very melancholy piece. Sorry, um, but yeah, the, the E minor Sarabande from the E minor English Suite is uh, is really it's really a tragic work, I, I think. Um, but as Bach so beautifully does, and we're gonna hear it throughout the day, he's able to weave together in this seamless tapestry all these dis you know variety of emotions. There's hopefulness. There's there's loss. There's shock. There's there's melancholy. And so I'm going to perform this for you as Sarabon and, uh, and welcome. When I'm done with this, my lecture will be done. So thank you for the questions and, uh, and enjoy the rest of the day. I hope to see you this afternoon.